Welcome to Godsplaining, contemplative preachers, contemporary age. Each week, join the Dominican friars as they consider all things Catholic. Hello, and welcome back to Godsplaining. I am Father Gregory Pine, joining here from Switzerland, which is a land filled with chocolate and cheese and Easter joy, all of which I am benefiting from insofar as one can in my splendid isolation. But enough about, you know, food and... <laughs> All right, I'm just going to introduce our friends here on this podcast. We've got Father Joseph Anthony joining from Charlottesville, Father Patrick Mary Briscoe <laughs> joining from Providence, Rhode Island. Start with Father Joseph Anthony. How are things there in Charlottesville? Uh, we're, we're in a land of Paschal Joy and uh, wineries and uh, springtime hikes in the Blue Ridge Mountains. So, yeah, I, I, we're in a good place. Jesus is risen. It's, it's beautiful out here. Nice. That's awesome. Father Patrick? I remained, in the, I remained in the land of gray desolation, you know, up here at PC College, as our neighbors in Cranston would say. Uh, you know, we're just, we don't, we don't have quite the intensity of the permaculture, but today it is not a nice spring day. So we have mm. to bring the joy of Easter, you know, to others because the sun is not doing it for us. Got it. Hey, well, uh, when you lack the sun for the giving of vitamin S -U -N. D. All right. Yeah, my bad. Yep. Uh-huh. You yourself have to be the sun to others. I think there, there's a friar in our province or maybe it was somebody else. Whatever. This is how stories get told in the province. You just attribute them wildly. And then sometimes you end up telling that story back to the person from whom it originated. Um, but I think there was a guy who served with the missionaries of charity and um, he was in one of their AIDS hospices. And he remarked the fact that none of the men had um, televisions in their rooms. And he was like, hey, that's kind of wild because, you know, every hospital that you visit everywhere, it's just you know, people watching TV for many hours on end or watching the television of their name, whatever. Okay. But uh, he, he commented on this to one of the sisters. He's like, sister, there's no TVs here. What's to be done? And she said, brother, you be TV. And he was like, got it. Okay, perfect. So in the absence of the sun, brother, you be sun. Um, so here we are uh, continuing our pilgrimage, as it were, through life to death, which is Father Patrick's greatest hope, uh, death, that sweet release. Um, but uh, before we die, we'll continue to comment on the scriptures. So today we're, we're talking about the readings from the third Sunday of Easter. Uh, so to lead it in, let's pray the prayer together from the beginning of the Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May your people exult forever, O God, as renewed in renewed youthfulness of spirit, so that rejoicing now in the restored glory of our adoption, we may look forward in confident hope to the rejoicing of the day of resurrection. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Father Joseph Anthony, would you lead us into the first reading? Absolutely. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter said to the people, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence when he had decided to release him. You denied the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. The author of life you put to death, but God raised him from the dead. Of this we are all witnesses. Now I know, brothers, that you acted out of ignorance, just as your leaders did. But God has thus brought to fulfillment what he had announced beforehand, through the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be wiped away. So in reading the scriptures, okay, so <laughs> I'm cheap, and I don't have a subs subscription to Magnificat, but I do have a free subscription to Prions en Eglise, which is like the cheap French version of Magnificat. Um, so when I do Lexio Divina, it's like a combination of marveling at the word and marveling at my ignorance of the French language. So some of my thoughts on the scripture are inspired by lack of comprehension. But I was struck in this first line where we read, Peter said to the people, um, in, in the French it said like, Jesus, or excuse me, Jesus wasn't acting in the first sentence of this, except insofar as he was aspiring Peter. Uh, but it said that Peter took the word, like he laid hold of the word or he seized the word. And that causing me a kind of wonder, a kind of, um, 
a kind of sense of the mystery that's at stake in the preaching act. Because uh, in giving testimony to his faith and giving testimony to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, Peter kind of makes use, as it were, of that proclamation. He makes use of grace. And that is not language that we are accustomed to use when talking about the mysteries of the life of faith, but it's a fact. Because when we talk about the life of nature, the life of grace, as it were, we have, well, we have a kind of possession over it. So it's God's by right, but he shares it with us so that we can make use of it. So just as we are outfitted with everything that we need to live a natural life, so by grace we are outfitted with everything that we need to live a genuinely supernatural life. And so we can take hold of the word. Um, it's not something that just passes through us and leaves us untouched. It's not something that we just kind of avail ourselves of in passing or avail ourselves at particular moments. It's something that we lay hold of and that lay, lays hold of us. So I think just this idea that, that God places divine things in our hands. God places divine things in our hearts. When we talk about the sacraments, specifically baptism or confirmation or holy orders, we talk about this idea of character, right? So you have this indelible mark imprinted upon your soul. Uh, and that mark is a participation in the priesthood of Christ. And so it makes you, by virtue of it, a priest in Christ. You know, so we talk about the, the priesthood of all believers, and that's uh, a different kind of priesthood shared in by those who are ordained. Um, but, but it gives you a kind of power, as it were, over grace. Uh, so it gives you the power to receive divine things, to lay hold of them. In the case of a priest, it gives him power to give divine things. So when we talk about the resurrection, sometimes it seems kind of ethereal or science fiction-y. Uh, but truth be told, it's something that we can lay hold of. It's something that we can proclaim because we are given to possess it in God's good pleasure, in God's gift of himself. So, um, you know, in the case of the proclamation that Peter makes, uh, that taking hold of was not, um, was not done well, right? It wasn't exercised with good custody. But in our case, we can make good use of it because the Lord himself, you know, wants us to know him, wants, him, wants us to love him, um, and, and makes it so that we can be good stewards, uh, that we can be uh, ministers, as it were, of that same word. So up here in Rhode Island, we have this chain called Honeydew Donuts. Father Gregory, have you ever been to a Honeydew Donuts? I I have not, but I am just intrigued as to where this is yeah. going. So please so say more. The, the thing about Honeydew Donuts is that it's obviously inferior to Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. Product placement. <laughs> yeah, that's Subtle. right. We received no we received Subtle. no money from Dunkin' Donuts for the taping of this episode. No, but so there so there are some things like Honeydew Donuts that are just inferior to uh to other things um you know and we can talk about uh, all of all of the different kinds of uh, purchasing decisions we make in our lives where we choose a brand name because we feel like it makes a difference um or it doesn't right and sometimes these things are up for debate you know there there are actually rhode islanders who prefer honeydew donuts they're wrong but that's fine uh, but there are some things that are not <laughs> up for debate there are some things that are that are just set and one one of the most moving moments I think of the Easter story, especially of our participation in the liturgy, is when we shout out the crowd, crucify him. When we ourselves take the place of those who choose other than the Lord, when we ourselves take uh, take upon ourselves the guilt of those who have preferred Barabbas to Jesus. Uh, so this is this is something that we bear. We, we, we bear the guilt of this sin in our own lives for, for preferring lots of things. To Christ, um, not not just not just Barabbas. Uh, so when when Peter is preaching that you denied the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be ra released to you, um, we can think of not not just our role in the making present of these mysteries during Holy Week, not just our role as the crowd where we say, "Crucify him and give us Barabbas." We can think not just of that role, but of our sins, of those moments when we personally betray Christ, when we prefer something other other than him in those moments it's not necessarily a murderer but we're we're choosing things other than christ and peter's preaching is so prescient because it it it, it bears that to mind and and it, it should inflict our consciences and drive us to think e each of us what is it what is it that i prefer what is it that i'm choosing that that's not christ that that kind of um, juxtaposition there between the murderer and the author of life is not just in the kind of 
what we see is the the kind of lyrical or the physical center of this passage, but it's also kind of the gravity point. Um, the fact that the murderer is the one who takes life. He, he, he destroys it. The murderer is the one that uh, rips life away and, and, and kind of extinguishes life. Uh, that is not proper to his authority. He has no uh, responsibility to that. Compared to the author of life, who from nothing as it gives and, and, and breathes new life and, and brings it into being in a real sense. And the way that Peter is preaching uh, about that kind of contradiction or those, those two polar opposites here um, is, is really captivating because it, it, we see the continuation of this type of preaching all the way through the successors of Peter you know, into our, our contemporary age. Right. This is something that John Paul II, the successor of Peter, would preach. And uh, Benedict the Sixteenth picked up on this and said this in his inauguration homily. Right. Jesus Christ takes nothing away from us, but gives us everything in return. So when we turn to him, when we follow, when we become believers of Jesus, dedicating our life to it, he doesn't rip life away from us. He doesn't murder our life and turn us into some, you know, robots of, you know, just like parallel or sanitized cookie cutter same things. We actually have this abundance of life because we've turned and become united. We become followers, disciples of the author of life. And it's because of his authorship in the living that he's able to approach the dead. He's able to approach those who have had their life ripped away because of the idols of this life, because uh, those who have had their lives ripped away because of um, you know, whatever addictions or whatever sins may have come about, whatever calumny has destroyed their life, the pride and vanities of this world, which has destroyed them, which has ripped the life out of them. It's Christ, the author of life, that stands before us and that is proclaimed through the voice of Peter, that is proclaimed throughout the generations in a new and saying, you have the opportunity to gain an abundance of life in this this, brothers and sisters, is what we are witnesses of because we proclaim it to each other in that real sense. All right. With that, let's pass on then to the second reading, which is taken from the first letter of St. John. My children, I am writing this to you so that you may not commit sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the expiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but for those of the whole world. The way we may be sure that we know him is to keep his commandments. Those who say, I know him, but do not keep his commandments, are liars, and the truth is not in them. But whoever keeps his word, the love of God is truly perfected in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we have this issue here, right, where it brings to bear a, a question that we phrase a little bit differently. So in our contemporary uh, parlance, we would be more, that's a father gregory word parlance <laughs> parlay parlance parlance in our contemporary parlance um we might be more inclined to say something like i'm spiritual but i'm not religious like oh i want to think of the things of god but i don't want them to have any impact on my life well the the author of this letter of the scriptures here sees this exactly and says no because it is impossible to say that you love god if you do not keep his commandments so there is an absolute link, something that cannot be separated between the demonstrating of the love of God, actually having the love of God, and keeping his commandments. Um, because the commandments are, are the vehicle, the means, the way by which we are able to know and to express the love of God. Uh, the charity demands union. That's what, that's what charity is, you know, particularly in the, in the Thomistic view. For Aquinas, um, charity is union, and as we've talked about many times on the podcast, um, we, we can describe charity as friendship. Friendship demands action. It, it, it demands service. It demands real movement um, to, to show that and to build and to foster and to serve that union. So, so to say uh, I'm spiritual and not religious is to say, well, I love God, but I'm not interested in keeping his commandments. And whatever that view is, um, because it's a very prevalent religious view, it's not Christianity. It's not the gospel, and it's not what we're talking about in the first letter of St. John today. 
I want to pick up on that that phrase, um, advocate, and how it says, if if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Um, that that manifests two realities for us: that Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who is the expiation of our stands, our, our sins, stands in the presence of the Father. And if we remember and and recall the words of our Lord the night before he went to his passion that he promised us that where he is, he will draw us to himself. And so we see that where is he right now? Well, he's with the father and he's going to draw us back to that. And in this pilgrim journey that if anyone does sins that he, he stands in the presence of the father to advocate for us. And I think there are times that we can uh, maybe recoil at some of the legislative language that we find within the scriptures. Um, but advocate is really a legislative uh, term, right? If we find it in the judicial courtrooms. There's an advocate for uh, the defendant in some way. And that this person who stands in the presence of the father advocates, but he defends, he sheds light. He speaks on the behalf of the one who is unable to speak, the one who is unable to defend themselves. And so Christ is that advocate. And when there has been transgression, right? Once again, this kind of legal legal terminology shouldn't be uh, you know, turned, brushed aside. But when there has been transgression, that it's Christ, the the eternal Son who stands in the Father, the place that He's promised to draw us to Himself, and advocates, defends, speaks on our behalf into that one way, one day where we're with Him perfectly in eternity. So I think that there, are, in the in the latter half of this reading, there are two kind of hinges upon which the reading turns. The first is this idea of knowing him, and the second is the idea of keeping his commandments. I suppose they're not so much ideas as they are realities. But I think that um, we hear a lot of conversation uh, in Catholic and Protestant apologetics about faith and works. And you have texts from the letter to the Romans, uh, where we are saved by faith. You have texts from the letter of James, faith that works is dead, but uh, we need to read the scriptures together in order to get a kind of more synthetic picture of what it means uh, to live by faith, to live by charity, as it were. And I think you have a really, really beautiful kind of thumbnail sketch of it here in this very short reading. Basically, the idea is that we are justified by faith, but that we're justified by faith, breathing forth love, which love is testified to by the presence of good works, right? By, by keeping the commandments. So you can think about this like at the level of faith, for instance, faith has an interior dimension and it has an exterior dimension. The interior dimension is belief. So we believe in God. We believe what God says of himself. We believe kind of into God, as it were, by habitual trust, by kind of leaning on his testimony. But it's also necessary that we give, we give witness to that faith. So if somebody were to say, you know, I need you to deny our Lord Jesus Christ in order to advance whatever judicial thing I have in the works, you can't say like, oh yeah, no problem, denied. Because... What you are saying, what you're professing with your lips, actually destroys what you formerly had in your heart. So this is why, you know, the, the testimony of the martyrs is so powerful, because they're asked to deny something. And it seems so trifling just to say, like, I don't believe in Jesus. You know, it's just a few words. Didn't take me too long to formulate that statement. But when you say that, you extinguish the interior life of faith, the interior life of grace within, by a kind of betrayal of friendship. So if we say that we know him, that has to be borne out in our lives because such is the nature of human existence, right? We're embodied souls or ensouled bodies. And so the faith that we cultivate, the, the faith which we seek to kind of deepen or intensify in our lives has to have this outlet because otherwise, um, how will it flourish? So if we say that we know him, we also have to keep his commandments. Are we justified by the keeping of his commandments? Well, in a certain sense, yes, but taken together with this idea of faith. So we are justified by faith, breathing forth love, and that love is made evident by keeping his commandments. So there you have just a nice, real, beautiful blend, a real beautiful balance of this whole kind of faith works debate in the, um, in the simple language of St. John. So with that, we will now pass on to the gospel, and Father Patrick will read this in anticipation of uh, our final round of comments. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. 
The two disciples recounted what had taken place on the way, and how Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. While they were still speaking about this, he stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were startled and terrified, and thought they were seeing a ghost. Then he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do questions arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I, myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they were still incredulous for joy and were amazed, he asked them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. He said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are the witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My favorite aspect of the Chris or the the Easter season, the entirety of the Easter season, is we get these accounts of um, those immediate encounters with the resurrected Lord. And why is this so important to us? Because the reality is that is who we encounter in this present day we are encountering the resurrected lord and looking at how he has interacted with those in those immediate moments and those immediate encounters post resurrection kind of sets up the paradigm and sets up the expectation of how the lord interacts with us and what we see throughout the entire thing is that the lord always initiates with questions you know, with uh, Mary Magdalene, he says, why are you weeping? That's his very first words after the resurrection. Why are you weeping? Um, on the road to Emmaus, first words out of the Lord's mouth. What are you talking about? You know, and, and when he stands on the, the shores of the sea after Peter and the rest of the apostles went back to fishing, he says, have you caught anything to eat? He's always initiating with questions. And here is the first time, actually, that he doesn't initiate with a question. He starts off, he initiates the encounter with peace be with you. Turning to uh, his disciples, who are all incredulous with joy at this point. They're recounting these stories, trying to figure out, the Lord met us on the road. The Lord met us at the tomb. It was empty and all this stuff. They have this kind of joyful expectation, but so many questions. And then the Lord enters in and says, peace be with you. And he does ask another question. Why are you troubled? It's me. Look, why, why are questions in your heart? Here I am. I'm, I'm back. I'm here for you. And as we continue, you know, celebrating this Easter season, as we continue our uh, joyful credulity in this way, that we have the Lord asking us those questions. Are you troubled? Why are you troubled? What, what, what's causing your anxiety? What's causing your grief? What, why are you, what are you talking about all the time? You know, what, 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 what's going on? What, what's so important that you're always talking? Um, and to hear the Lord truly ask these very questions into our current day, into our present day, into our lives, our families, our classrooms, the Lord desires to know. But in building this uh, relationship with the resurrected Lord, that he asks questions. Uh, and we, we need to draw and, and respond to those questions with authenticity, with honesty. It may not be the most kind of idyllic, perfect example that we want to give, but maybe what troubles us is, you know, different aspects of doubts in our faith. Maybe what troubles us or causes our weeping is, is real suffering that we have trouble understanding why pain happens and why evil exists in the society that we live. But do not be afraid to hear the Lord speak those questions anew and afresh into our contemporary and our, our current lives, but to respond with authenticity because the Lord, only thing the Lord desires is all that we have right now. It may not be perfect. It may not, it may be a little rough around the edges and that's all right. But the Lord 
in these repeated encounters after the resurrection reveals to us his deepest desire to ask the questions about our life and where we are and to have us encounter his resurrection right where we are, whether that's in our weeping, in our troubledness, or in our conversations. The Lord wants to be in, a, in the heart of that. I want to let you know that right now I'm tempted to preach my entire Sunday homily, but I'm not going to because I would be made fun of that mercilessly by Father Patrick. Uh, so I'm just going to preach three quarters of it. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> but, but seriously also. Um, so something that's remarkable about the Gospel of Luke is that it's very much like the Gospel of Matthew and Mark, but that the slight variations uh, draw your attention to novel features of the Gospel proclamation. So Luke is very deliberate in the way that he arranges the data, uh, the way that he arranges these stories. And he tells you as much in the first four, vo for, blah, 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 first four verses. That's tough uh, uh, of the gospel. I suppose it's tough for me. Um, so in Matthew and in Mark, you have these three passion predictions. So in Mark, it's very, uh, it's very clear, like there's this hinge point in the gospel. So when you get up to chapter 8, things start accelerating towards Jerusalem. And in chapters 8, 9, and 10, the Lord foretells that he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to be handed over, as it were. He's going to suffer. He's going to die. He's going to rise from the dead. These predictions are met with incomprehension. Now, in the Gospel of Luke, it's kind of hard to pick out those same predictions. They're kind of there. They're kind of not. They're formulated in a different way. But what's wild is that those same passion predictions are repeated after the fact. So by the angel and by the Lord himself. And we have the Lord's testimony here of what happened, which is strange because it already happened. So why would you predict it? But I think here you have a kind of insight into the way that we interact with the mysteries of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because on the one hand, okay, so God is eternal. So he possesses all of his life in one now, in one instant. But we are not eternal, okay? We live in time. And so we only possess our lives from instant to instant. So this moment, I've kind of lost hold of what I was, uh, and I have not yet taken hold of what I will be. And part of my life is kind of, I don't know, working together uh, the integrity of that story, which, which passes just as much as it kind of courses through time. And so the Lord, in his proclamation, in his Easter proclamation of what has taken place, is giving us the interpretive key. So we are to live our lives in anticipation of the good things that are to come, but we're also to look back on our lives upon the good things that have transpired so that what we experience as a kind of narrative, we can get better at interpreting and ultimately that we can be re recollected in that reality. So the incarnation, uh, the Paschal mystery holds the key to unlocking the intelligibility, the coherence, the very substance of our human lives. But we need to be constantly looking forward to it, looking back towards it, looking into it, as it were, so that it can unriddle for us our very perplexing existence. So while it may seem strange that the Lord predicts something that has already taken place, it's a strangeness that corresponds to our strange human state, which is a state that is a story in the process of being told a story in the process of being interpreted, a story in the process of coming to make sense. But by his grace, right, by the mysteries which he applies to our lives, which he, which he merits for us, right, it, it has the possibility of being made sense of, right? And we, we have that confidence because the Lord himself has revealed it, because he has preached it, because he has, because he has suffered it and risen with it. Yeah, for... For all that uh, Father Gregory said there, you know, and I don't disagree, but I, I think this gospel <laughs> is fundamentally a gospel, but I do disagree. I think this gospel is fundamentally a gospel of divine mercy, okay? <laughs> so I still I still have, like, you know, I'm still riding the little Fausti train hard from Divine Mercy Sunday, so bless <laughs> up Sister Faustina. Father Patrick is right there with you, you know? Um, we might We might even say that I'm just like coasting on her veil tail or something like you know just just riding the wings of divine mercy just keep going uh you know yeah that's right just you know, I, i'm trying to find a way to say i'm drafting up you know running the running the race i'm sorry you said okay. this was better than what i said okay <laughs> <laughs> yes because this is commentary on this gospel as divine mercy so the lord <laughs> seeing their fear and terror responds with what they need to be convicted and that this is not primarily about uh, the conviction of the gospel but rather the lord recognizing what they need to 
undertake the mission which he has entrusted to them. So in order that the world might be evangelized beginning with Jerusalem, he knows, the Lord Jesus knows, that his dearest friends, his disciples, his followers need to be absolutely convicted in what he has in what he has done in the work that he has done so what does he do he eats he eats and this <laughs> is an act of mercy because this act allows the disciples to be able to believe that he is truly risen so in the so in the deepest places in their minds and hearts they've been totally convicted by that piece of baked fish that everything the Lord Jesus has said and done is true. And because of that act of mercy, because this is a gospel of mercy, they are able to spread the gospel to the whole world. The defense rests. <laughs> the advocate rests. Well, there you have it, listeners. Father Patrick began with donuts and ended with baked fish. And we are all the baked better fish. blessed for it. <laughs> Um, Need lunch so, today. I'm the, hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. What gave it away? What gave it away? My goodness. <laughs> so thanks so much for, for listening to this episode. Please do share it with those uh, whom you think could, um, yeah, use some encouragement in this here Easter season. I know that as we continue to feast, sometimes the heaviness of feasting uh, is, uh, is weighing upon us because we're like, wow, I'm told to be joyful by this season. But alas and alack, I don't feel especially joyful. So, uh, <laughs> insofar as this episode could be a vehicle of joy, please do share it, like it, um, leave a comment. Also, thanks so much to our patrons who support the work of the podcast, uh, which uh, in large part goes to um, Katie, Katie Parker, whom we employ to edit the audio and the video. So, let's say theoretically, one of the friars goes and tries to read the second reading when it's not assigned to him. You know, she can edit that kind of stuff out, you know, not that that would ever happen, anything like that. Just kidding, but seriously. Uh, so, thanks so much for supporting the podcast. And then one more announcement is um, for those of you who are 21 Jacob to 33. Person, I wrote it down. <laughs> savage i gotta get back you know because if i let the burn count get too high then i just am totally undone over here um so please for those who are 21 to 33 please check out uh, godsplaining.org for information on our retreat which is almost filled up uh so it's july 23rd through 25th in huntington new york which is uh on long island and um that'll be a, a weekend retreat there Friday to Sunday, where all five of us who contribute to the podcast will be present. So typical retreat where you have divine office and mass, confessions, adoration, talks, time to enjoy each other's company, all such like things. Um, so yeah, with that, we're going to leave you with the final prayer. Uh, know that we're praying for you. Please pray for us. And let us pray. Receive, O Lord, we pray, this offering of your exultant church. And as you have given her cause for such great gladness, Grant also that the gifts we bring may bear fruit in perpetual happiness. Through Christ our Lord, amen. So thanks so much for listening, and we will catch you next time on God's Planning. Thanks for listening to God's Planning, a work of the Dominican Friars of the Province of St. Joseph. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Leave a review on your podcast app and visit us at godsplaining.org.